All right. Uh, so now we're going to get back into lightning talks. Uh, first up, we have uh, Ra Raul from uh, Oregon State University. Okay. Hi. Uh, I'm Rahul Gopinath, a PhD st student from Oregon State University, and this is a summary of my research along with that of Iftikhar Ahmed from the same university. So this talk is about evaluating test feeds and the best metrics we have in actually ascertaining the quality of our test feeds. And by quality, I mean the ability of a test feed to find bugs. So before starting, a question. So how many of you were present at GTAC 15? Okay. So in that talk, there was another talk with a very similar title that said that code coverage is not a strong predictor for the suite quality. So this is actually a counter argument. So it was suggested previously that uh, you know, we should not actually look at code coverage and it's not trustworthy, and we should look at something called mutation coverage. So uh, I really tried, to, I, will, I hope to convince you otherwise, and I also hope to show that the suggested gold standard, that's a mutation and a mutation score for test suite, is not only expensive to actually compute, but also inconsistent, and is very much dependent on the tool that we use to measure the mutation score. So essentially, mutation score is not really a silver bullet, and we have to use, in con we have to use it in conjunction with uh, the, sc uh, the coverage of a test suite. So, uh, well, when is a program ready to ship? Notwithstanding the comments about uh, you know, testing it in production for the Google Drive, the Google automatic car, this is one of the biggest decisions that we as testers have to make. And in the old-fashioned way, we usually stop testing when we are reasonably sure that the bugs are completely over. Not the new <laughs> way, of course. So that means that an effective test suite is very important. And that's, that's what we really need to find. How do we actually make sure that our test suites are effective? And how do we actually evaluate this test suite effectiveness? Of course, there are two main things that we all know that we can evaluate in a test suite. How good is its coverage of the program elements? And secondly, what is the strength of its oracles? By oracles, I mean just assertions, because if you don't have assertions, then it's useless. So in the previous G-talk, Laura Inozemetsaw, who actually did that talk, she suggested that coverage should not be relied on because it rarely provides more information than just the pure size of the test suite. So she instead suggested mutation score, where the effectiveness of a test suite against uh, a set of mutants is evaluated. How many of you know actually know mutation score? How do we evaluate mutation? OK, so at least I know that there are a few people who are around here. And I also heard first day that Google is also, some of the people in Google are also using mutation score. So it's not completely out of the blue. The unfortunate thing is that, well, um, as a basic idea, what we do in mutation analysis is that we start with a program. And then for each token in the program, we start introducing changes. What are the changes that are valid grammatically that if you compile will not result in an error? So we have a large number of variants to that program. Each variant, you compile and run it against your test suite and see how many of these variants are actually caught by the test suite. The total number of variants that are caught by the test suite divided by the total number of mutants gives you the mutation score. That essentially means that this is the actual effectiveness of the test suite. The unfortunate thing is that after Laura's speech, um, programs, especially in the programmers community like Hacker News or Reddit, they all uh, took it to mean that uh, we should really completely discard coverage. And uh, uh, the comments were that coverage is meaningless in the real world, and arbitrary lines in sand such as 90% or 100% coverage is pretty much, it, they don't provide any utility. But is that sufficient? I mean, is it sufficient to ignore coverage? So that is what we set out to find. So to start from the very basics, there are two factors, of course, you know, assertions and coverage. And coverage on its own is useless without assertions, and assertions have to be paired with good high coverage test suites. And Laura's idea is that coverage is completely determined by the size of the test suite, and that it doesn't actually tell us anything new because it so closely correlates with the size of the test suite. So since test suite is so easily determinable without even actually running it, what is the point of actually looking at coverage? 
and why not just use the test suite size instead? That was, that was the point in the previous talk. However, the question is, does it actually make sense to control for the size of the test suite? It's not a good measure. We do not actually know what is the maximum number of tests that can be there in a test suite, even for the same program, because you can have different test suites for the same program. And different tests are not necessarily equivalent in strength. There can be some tests which actually identify a larger number of uh, problems, and there, are, there might be tests which are specific. So size of the test suite, while it is simple, is not really a reasonable measure, because we don't really have any uh, you know, uh, endpoints. There is no 0% test suite size or 100% test suite size. So one of my points is that even if Coverage just measures test suite size. It's a good thing to have because at least it tells us how large the test suite is. And secondly, um, none of us actually cares about the total number of uh, tests that we run. We may have a time budget, we may have other kinds of budget, but not really related to the number of tests. So for a practicing tester, there is only one single question. Can I use coverage to measure the test suite effectiveness? And this is what we set out to find in my research. So what we did was that we started with 250 real world programs for the study from GitHub. And uh, the largest was greater than 100 kilo lines of code. So these are not toy programs. And we checked coverage for both organic, that is, uh, coverage uh, the test suites that are written by people like us, and also machine generated uh, tests that are uh, you know generated by Rando. So we found that for these organic test suites that are written by human beings, if a statement is covered, then that statement has 87 percent chance of uh, if if there is any mutant in that particular statement, that mutant has 87 percent chance of being detected. And if you have a statement coverage, then that can actually predict mutation score with 94% certainty. That is, once you control for statement coverage, mutation score actually provides only 6% extra variability that you can, you, can, you, know, you can evaluate. So this is another thing. Uh, the, red one, the previous blue ones were uh, developer written, and these red ones are automatically generated by Randomly. So as you can expect, the oracles are really bad. And uh, there is only 61% chance that if a line is covered, that particular, any mutant in that particular line will be caught by the test suite, for, by the randomly generated test suite. So given this result, there, there's a question that we can ask. So if coverage is so highly correlated with mutation score, what's the point of using mutation score? I mean, we can essentially just use coverage and uh, predict the mutation score instead. So until now, we assume that coverage provides no extra information with, uh, with respect to test suite size. That is the assumption that Laura started with. Uh, th that was the result that Laura had. However, the question is, is that particular question, is that assumption really true? Remember that her results were actually from just five programs, even though very large programs, but still only five programs, while we actually have 250 programs. And she was also using random subsets of the same test suite again and again and again. So is it possible that her conclusion that coverage is directly related with test suite size may not actually generalize to the larger programs? So this is what we actually wanted to find. So what we did was that we eliminated the effect of test suite st size statistically. And we actually found that even if you control for the test suite size, for the remaining um, amount of information that is provided by the mutation coverage, 74% of it is still explained by the uh, statement coverage score. So, that means that the previous assumption or previous result from, of Laura from these five programs are actually not generalizable to a larger number of programs, especially large programs and more random programs not exactly you know, chosen by the researcher themselves, which is a major issue in the software engineering research because usually there is a you know, problem that we rely very heavily on specific um, programs which are used of again and again. So even if coverage is um, a reasonably good criteria, 
it's still possible that we might actually go for mutation analysis. Because in some sense, mutation analysis comes very close to actual bugs, because we are actually introducing bugs into the program and evaluating how many of these are caught. So should we actually use mutation analysis? Is it actually ready for the prime time? Or the question is, should we use mutation analysis as the primary means of evaluating quality of suite? So unfortunately, mutation analysis is beset with a large number of problems. The biggest thing is, of course, the total, the large number of variants. Each of these variants have to be tested by the complete test suite. And uh, oh, there is no way out of it. We essentially have to evaluate each of them. Even small little programs like B squared minus 4AC tend to produce large number of mutants. And secondly, so that mutation score is really costly. And uh, even if you ignore the size of the mutation analysis, there is another major problem. These are called equivalent mutants. The problem is that these changes that we introduce, the tiny little changes that we make to the program, they need not always result in a fault. Some of them can actually result in programs which are behaviorally same as that of the original program. These are called semantic clones. Or in, the, in terms of uh, mutation analysis terminology, these are called equivalent mutants. The problem is that if you have a program, uh, if you have a program which produces, say, 50% equivalent mutants, None of the test suites that you can ever write is going to have a mutation score that is larger than 50%. So, uh, and unfortunately, there is no general way, as of now, in software engineering research, to identify how much of uh, mutants would actually be equivalent given a program, nor can we identify, given two programs, whether one, uh, sorry, a mutant and a program, whether the mutant is going to be equivalent to the program. So this is a result from, uh, you know, Turing uh, computation. This is called Rice theorem that essentially says that a general way to do that is pretty much impossible. So that means that a low mutation score is not generally indicative. It it doesn't actually indicate a low quality of test suite in general. I mean, it can be true for most of the times, but if your program is a unique snowflake, then it is possible that you have a low mutation score, but you actually have a test suite that is highly effective. And even worse is something called uh, redundant mutants. So redundant mutants are still semantic clones. They are semantic clones of each other. They have a fault in them, but there are a large number of mutants which are exactly the same fault. So if your test case detects at least one of them, then the rest of it falls. So what that means is that if you have a large amount of redundant mutants and your test, test suite catches one of them, then you will have a high mutation score, even though the test suite may not actually have been very you know, effective. So we can't really trust mutation score on that score either. And finally, uh, this is a problem with the current state of the art. This is not a problem with mutation analysis itself. The problem is that different mutation tools have very different, um, you know, they act on very different levels. So you can act, you can have a mutation score that, uh, mutation tool that acts on the assembly or in the machine code or on the, um, the source code itself. So here I see, uh, here I show two different ways in which you can have uh, mutants, one on the source code itself and the other on the assembly. And the problem is that uh, we have on the left uh, the mutation score that is computed by three different tools that act on three different levels. And the problem is that these tools do not actually agree with each other that well. So you can see that there. So, this is the current state of the art for mutation analysis. So it's not consistent across different tools. So finally, the proof of coverage is actually, uh, the proof of uh, it is in the pudding. So if coverage is a good measure of test suite effectiveness, then uh, a well-tested program that we assume by using coverage should actually result in fewer bug fixes. And we should be able to find the difference between uh, you know, covered and uncovered programs, uh, or covered and uncovered lines in the same program. And this is what we did next using the same 250 programs. So what we did was that we started with an epoch and then counted the bug fixes that happen on that particular line until it was actually wiped out by a feature fix. So what we actually found is very interesting we found that if there is a line that is covered, and you compared that to any general line that is not covered, a covered line is 
uh, or an uncovered line is twice as likely to have a bug fix as that of a covered line. And that is true across statement, block, or method level. That is, if you have a method that is at least tested or covered by some test case wherever, that method would have half bug fixes in its future compared to a method that did not even have a single test case covering it. We don't have sufficient uh, data for class, so you can see that our p-values are somewhat low. I mean, we don't have significance there. So yes, coverage is a very strong defense against future bugs, irrespective of what others say. So in summary, coverage is still the best measure that we have for evaluating test fit quality. And um, mutation score can at best provide a secondary measure, so don't rely uh, solely on mutation score. And also, if you're using mutation score, understand the problems of mutation score. It is expensive, it is costly, uh, it is unreliable, and provides maybe a little extra information, like 6% beyond uh, coverage. And more importantly, in addition to the, uh, you know, the simple measures like mutation score or coverage, if you actually look at which statements are actually not covered and try and see why it is not covered, or look at even mutants, look at uh, the mutants that are not killed and see why it is not killed, that is probably a very good testing technique in itself. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, thank you, Ro. Uh, uh, so with lightning talk, we'll take uh, one question. Uh, oh, oh, wait, it's Laura from last year. She's calling, she, has, she wants a word. <laughs> she wants to talk to you. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, so I think that covers the first one we'll ask. Uh, do, you, do you have an opinion or studies on code coverage effectiveness with property-based tests. So I will start with the first one first, okay. because this is an ongoing argument between us, whether mutation analysis is ready for prime time use. And you know what my opinion is. So software engineering community is trying to come up with better tools to actually remove equal mutants and uh, you know, um, redundant mutants and come up with better tools. So that is where engineering community as of now stands. Okay, and uh, do you have an opinion on studies on code convergence effect? Uh, do you mean court coverage? Well, uh, well, court coverage effectiveness is pretty good, um, and I think property-based tests are really good, as, as, especially uh, things like quick check. Those actually help you quite well. But the problem with property-based testing is that it's really hard to write uh, that kind of test. I mean, you really need programmers who are well versed in that. Yeah. All right. Excellent. So thank you, Raul. 